Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video as you see fit, so feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below and I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like because the purpose of this channel is educational in regards to atheist and deconversion issues and any issues related to those issues. A hearty shout out to the Rabid Nation. Uh, hit that subscribe button to join the nation. And if you want to buy your citizenship, hit the join button. Um, today, I want to continue on in my deconversion story. Uh, this is part 11. Uh, when we left off, I had left the Assemblies of God. I was in kind of a year of limbo where I wasn't really sure what I was going to be doing with my life in general, let alone whether or not I was going to continue on as a minister. So um, what I ended up doing is kind of waiting around, and then one day I received a phone call. And, uh, uh, you know, I was kind of just getting my life back together. My kids had relocated. They were doing well in school. Uh, my one oldest son was about to graduate. I think he had actually, uh, well, no, he was about to graduate uh, uh, high school. And so a lot of things were going well. That was a really good year on a personal level in some ways because I watched all my kids really blossom and gloom and bloom out and, and it was just a, a nice time for me to enjoy them. I actually enjoyed my kids as teenagers far more than I did when they were little. Um, so it became more of a conversational thing where I could treat them as friends and things like that and I've always enjoyed that part of it and I kind of miss it now because they're all grown up and have kids of their own. But that year was a really good year but at the end of it I got a phone call. And this person had been a friend of my dad's, and uh, he was facing uh, a problem. And I had also met this guy in other churches that we had worked with. And he was working with a church at the time that was in need of a pastor. It's a local church. Uh, it's one of the oldest churches in the area, still is. And uh, they needed a pastor because their previous pastor had left in April. And they were calling around in May and trying to find people to replace them. And they wanted to know if I would try out. And I said, well, what's the procedure here? And they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have you come in and preach a month. We have this other candidate. We're going to have him preach every Sunday for a month. And then we have a third candidate we want to preach every month in August. And then we'll come back to it in early September. And we'll vote on who we want. So I spent the month of June... Uh, after watching my kids, grad, my oldest son graduate, I spent the month of June preaching in a church. Uh, didn't really, I told my wife that what I was doing, but she wasn't really all that thrilled about it. Um, and I was a little bit in trepidation too, because this church was independent. It was congregational. Um, it had been part of the Church of Christ, but when the Church of Christ decided to become homos, you know, homosexual friendly, they decided not to become homosexual friend, and so they left the uh, the Church of Christ. Now, I didn't, at that point in my own theology, I really didn't care about the LGBTQ issues per se. I figured, you know, where should sinners be but in the church? But, um, and so at the time, I was pretty open to that, so I was a little bit intrepidatious. There was certain doctrines of the church that the previous pastor had had that had attracted certain people, like once saved, always saved, which I didn't hold, and other things like that. Um, but I didn't have a problem with rubbing shoulders with those types of Christians at that point. I was very much interested in a, uh, a church that could bridge people together rather than separate on s silly grounds. And what I discovered is this church was actually probably at the time a perfect church for me to pastor because when I, I read through the doctrinal statement, um, there was a lot of things that I like, well, oh, okay, this is pretty general. So that really opens things up. So uh, I preached the month of June and then I waited. Um, and then I guess one, the third guy dropped out. So they brought me back to preach through the month of August and then they were going to decide at the end, and in the end, they voted on me, and I was voted in unanimously, pretty much, and uh, took the position of pastor of this church, this congregational church. Uh, this congregational church is a historical building. It's you know four stories tall with the old Gothic architecture, though 
and it had a basement and things like that. And, you know, it had a lot of interesting stories and a lot of interesting history. It was weird being in a building that had pretty much been around since, you know, Ulysses S. Grant was president. So <clears throat> it, it had some pretty deep roots. But at the same time, it was also congregational. So what I left behind, what I, I pushed away at that point, was this idea of theological bondage. I was always, in, in the Assemblies of God, I always had this narrow confine of, you know, these are the 16 fundamental truths. You can't go outside of this. You can't have different views on Pentecostalism, tongues, all this other stuff. And I still believe that at the time that God still do, did stuff, I was had my questions, of course, because I was looking at all the fraud and, you know, I had to be honest with myself at that time, I hadn't really seen a real miracle per se, you know, just stuff that couldn't be verified that people said was miracles. So at that point, I I realized that I had a lot of theological freedom. The, you know, the other thing I was leaving behind was denominational patrol because this is an independent church. I was technically the pastor, the bishop, and whatever else. I was the only real religious figure in the place. And they kind of just, you know, once I was anointed pastor, it was just, that was the end of it. I didn't have anybody to report to. I didn't have anybody to oversee me. That had, in two ways, one that caused a great little sigh of relief because all my experience with all these people had always been negative. And yet at the same time, there's a lot of fear and trepidation, you know, who am I, you know, to be this dude? Um... And the third thing I left behind was all these other expectations of what the ministry was about from a denominational perspective. I got rid of the Pentecostal expectations. I got rid of the suit and tie expectations. Uh, for the rest of my ministry, I think I wore suit and ties only for weddings and for funerals. The rest of the time, I was in a polo shirt, a nice pair of slacks, and a pair of dress shoes. And um, that's how I, I ran my thing. I never really got into all of that. Occasionally, I would throw the sports coat over it if it was cold or something like that, but that was about it. And uh, I just decided to be myself. So what I gained out of all this was theological freedom. In particular, I was now able to look at my theology and not worry about somebody else kicking me out of the denomination because I went a certain theological direction. I was able to more fully explore my open theism. I was more able to explore various doctrines, take out all angles, uh, something that will come to fruition in a blog I'll write, but I'll talk about that in a different video because it's it stands alone as its own importance. Uh, but um, I also had to uh, gain congregational government. Uh, the best way I can say is how this is a gain is the church basically had me, the pastor, and then it had a church council of seven, and then it had a moderator. The moderator and me did not have any voting power, but the moderator was the one who ran the meetings and decided the order of, of what would be talked about and things like that. And then there was me where I could express my concerns every meeting, but the, the other seven people were the only ones with voting power. And they all had to take on responsibilities such as being the treasurer, or being maintenance, or you know provisions and things like that. We ran a shepherd's table, so there was people on the board that were involved in that. So everything financial, physical, really wasn't my thing anymore. I didn't have to be the business manager of the church like I had been in the past in the Assemblies of God. So I didn't really have to deal with the money hardly at all, which was a good thing. Uh, and I got to be myself. I was not going to be anything else but myself. I had gotten fed up with trying to put the plastic veneer on what I was. Now, by myself, of course, being now knowing that I'm autistic, you know, at the time I'm like, well, I'm introverted, but now I know that there's a certain level I would get to where I just would stop dealing with stress and problems, and then I would just go home. And I wasn't going to, you know, there's an old analogy of, of pastors having their wives and then having their mistresses, which is the church. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. My first two mistresses had been, well, pretty dirty to me and cheating and everything else. And I was determined not to make this one my mistress. You know, um, it'll become that at the end, but not 
not in a good way again, but I, but at the time, at the beginning, I was doing pretty good with it. So, you know, I was determined to, to just let it be the church and not get sucked into everything. And like I said, it was voted in unanimously. Now, this church didn't, wasn't without its problems. It had its internal politics. Uh, there was a, still a lot of bad blood from voting themselves out of the Church of Christ. Uh, umbrella organization, some people wanted to go back into that, some people didn't. But there were more people that didn't than did, so um, it didn't really fly. There were also uh, uh, basically two people that were kind of lay people that were heads of the church, which I just waited, and sure enough, one of them left. So, uh, and, you know, I did it with good graces, shook my hand after a couple of years and said, thank you very much, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there was a lot of internal friction. There was a lot of bad blood, and... Uh, I spent the first two years preaching love, forgiveness, and uh, peace, you know, and then enforcing it with my actions by acting in that way, being a loving, caring, forgiving person. And um, it worked. It really did work. Uh, the other issue, of course, was the financial issues. At least that's what they thought. They thought they had bad finances, but it was the church that had the deepest pockets of all the churches that I ever pastored, I think. Uh, there was lots of money in reserve. There was, you know, money in investments, things like that. It had deep pockets, okay? So it was like I wasn't really worried about not getting paid, but they didn't pay me very much anyway. Uh, the only financial concern really was the fact that the offerings were pretty abysmal. And that's because the church had dwindled down to about 8 to 12 people on Sunday morning. Now, when I was elected, about 25 people showed up because everybody that was a member of the church was going to vote, but the church didn't have an attendance requirement, okay? You didn't have to go to be a member. Uh, you could be a member of the church and still vote on things just by being part of the community. So it was kind of different for me because in the Assemblies of God, it had all these membership requirements, and I didn't have to do that anymore. I was not, I was not the membership police. It wasn't my job to police them. It was more, uh, more the council's job. Uh, there was a lot of people that had, uh, the one situation was people had stole some money. So the financial issue is more of trust than it was having money. Um, so just kind of, you know, trying to gauge the church. So what I did is um, I watched the political situation kind of sort out itself. I just waited for a little while. And sure enough, the two people in the power struggle, one of them, simply was in a better position politically and the other person left and I made friends with the one that stayed. So, which would be to my downfall at the end, but for the first four or five years, it was a good partnership. Uh, both him and I kind of agreed on a lot of things in the beginning, so we worked well together. Uh, and then, of course, I preached love, forgiveness, peace. Um, and financially, I just, I didn't really worry about it because I knew they had deep pockets and I knew that I wasn't going to not get paid. I mean, they paid me an organist and a pianist. So there were three paid staff in this church and uh, you know, it was kind of old style. Uh, the liturgy was a mix of, you know, you know, everything was written out in the bulletin every morning where there was a liturgy, but the liturgy was very fluid a little bit. I could do a lot of different things. There were just certain things that were always there, you know, and uh, I just kept them. I didn't change things that much. I did change the things to reflect more my style. So uh, that's kind of where it went. Now, how did this fit into deconversion? Because uh, if I go back to the theological freedom, okay, and the fact that nobody was telling me what to believe or what to think about God, this enabled me to open up and begin to really explore the scriptures and think anything I wanted to. There was, you know, you know, and I could look at these problematic passages very, very honestly. I didn't have um, your, you know, the typical, you know, stuff where I was like dealing with, you know, I can't say that because that's outside the fundamentalist realm. I wasn't a fundamentalist anymore. Uh, I became, I don't know, a mix of conservative, liberal, whatever. I would look at any theological issue and it would allow me to take what the Bible said and just deal with that. And if there were contradictions, to work on those contradictions myself. I didn't have anybody to necessarily bounce things off of. And so 
how that led to my deconversion, I'm going to talk about in the next part where I talk about the fact that I got to a point where I finally sat down and I said, okay, I'm going to start a blog and I'm going to start exploring these theological issues. And it ended up being more than that because I started some creative writing and a few other things and talking about other things as well. But I began to write as a believer and a pastor who is struggling with stuff. Now, if you go back to read that blog, which I'll talk about next week, you'll see that I seem to be staying on the status quo, but what I'm writing about at that moment kind of is a chronological, this is the theology or this is the biblical passage or this is the topic that I'm having struggles with at that moment. So if you look at the dates on those posts, you know, there's a time where I'm writing about uh, marriage in the Bible, and it's like a 50-part series. I was really struggling with what the hell biblically is marriage, and what the, does the Bible say about these things. Uh, I wrote, you know, uh, later on I would write about the doctrine of hell, and I would write about the book of Revelation. I would write about different books of Scripture. There were times I would take my sermons and I would talk about them and why I did certain things certain way because I was having a problem with that too. You know, how does one you know actually preach a sermon if you're really just looking at kind of the tenor of the passage and not the exact words because the exact words are problematic? Uh, I was struggling with various problem of evil issues and everything else. So I'll talk more about this in the next part because this is one of those overarching issues is my blog. Because that blog will become my testing ground for any theology. I, I really treated everything like Parliament treats a bill. You know, I just, I ripped it to shreds. I tried to destroy it and tried to find anything left standing. But I also began to allegorize my theological strugglers. There's a, a post in there that I'll talk about next time, but, um, you know, and uh, we'll open that up uh, next week. But at this point, I'm just, it's the theological freedom. I now can explore all these questions that I've had for years, and I would start to discover so many things. And then in the context of the ministry, I would begin to do other things to kind of, is there another way to look at this? Um, I really had a Karl Barth kind of idea about the Word of God at this point, that, you know, the Word of God was Jesus, the Word of God was the Bible, and the Word of God could be preaching, okay, that there was an element of spiritual life to preaching that made it the Word of God as well. And so when I started to look at my preaching, I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense because I'm, you know, contradictory when I preach sometimes, and despite my best efforts. And so that became kind of the centerpiece of my struggles and um, the theological freedom opened me up so I could think about issues instead of just knee jerking what the denomination told me to. You know, what kind of Christian was I going to be? What thing did I have to stay on to truly be Christian? And at what point did I leave up being Christian at all and become something else? It became a real struggle for me and a real thing because all these other questions of the life of Christ, because I did teach life of Christ again, comes up again. I you know, I had all these issues. I would teach a class on comparative religions because I was really looking at, well, why do I think Christianity is the best one? And on and on the list will go. And I'll talk more about that in future episodes. But what I want you to understand at this point is the change brought me, put me in a position in 2008 where I could explore what it really meant to be a Christian. You know, I was 39 years old. Uh, I turned 40, you know, beginning of the next year in 2009, and uh, I started my ministry uh, in church number three, a congregational church. And so, you know, that's where I'm going to leave it today, and we'll pick up, I, I'm going to do, probably next time I'm going to do another one of those overarching ver videos where I talk about my blog, uh, because my blog that I was writing at the time becomes the chronological struggles that I was having with a lot of issues. So um, it became, it became a, it, it still is there and it stands as a record of what I did. And I'll probably leave a link in the description, maybe not this week, but next week, so you can take a look at it. Um, some of you already know where it is and some of you already know what it is, so there'll be that. But I wanna, I wanna hold that thought for you, but just know that theological freedom was in the works. 
Well, that's enough for this part of my deconversion story. And so thank you for once again for stopping by. You know, be sure to like the video or dislike it. Uh, any like you give kind of gets the video attention and that gets me more views and more time. If you're really a supporter of this channel and you really like what I do, uh, that's the most basic thing you can do is just get me noticed is like and share and comment, do the things that you do. I appreciate every single bit of you. Uh, consider joining the Rabid Nation. Um, hit that subscribe button. You know, if you want to buy your citizenship, as I, I jokingly say, you're, you're always welcome to hit that join button and get your options. Thank you very much for my one member so far. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, sooner or later, I'll probably get some intro and outro things as the channel grows. I've got a lot of things to do. Uh, one announcement is I am very much going to... Um, try to do a video every day and be at a premiere every day. Uh, may not always be possible to premiere an episode, but I'm going to try to do an episode every time. The reason I'm doing this is just to get more attention. Um, and it also fits my autism better because if, if I have something that's a daily routine, I tend to do it more and, and more consistently. And I've been having some trouble with consistency with the videos, at least in my own personal life. So this just makes it easier. So thank you for that. So, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, reconstruction and deconversion and, you know, deconstruction and reconstruction, basically. Uh, Sundays with Rabbit Atheists, I'll probably just deal with comments and the tenor of comments for the week. And you guys will, through your comments, kind of set the tone of what Sundays with Rabbit Atheists be. Mondays, I think I'll do like a list of things um, on sub-subject. Uh, Tuesday, I've already slated for a Bible study time. And then uh, Wednesday, I'm thinking of bringing in the wonderful world of religion and politics and talking about issues related to religion and politics and just giving my opinion. I'm not a, you know, I've got a few degrees here, but I'm not like a doctorate in anything. So I wouldn't consider myself an expert. I at least can knowledgeably wade through those topics and not feel lost. So that's kind of where the future of the channel is going. So once again, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate every one of you. Make sure you live your best life. You only get one go around and uh, then it's over. Uh, don't waste your time on the trappings of religion. Don't waste your opportunities, your money, your talent or anything on that because that's a dead end. And instead, embrace the reality of life and go forward with it. I think you'll find that you'll be much, 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 much more happy. And I appreciate all of you stopping by once again. And thank you. And I'll catch you next time.